Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our now start all network online call. Today is March 18th, and we're here today with our guest, Pam Bridgehouse. It's wonderful to have, have Pam with us. Pam has been working with Lutheran Latino Ministries for many years, and she's going to share with us a little bit about her background, uh, how she got into Lutheran Latino Ministries and serving with them, what God's done with her through that, and especially how God led her from a place of just not knowing what, what kind of service he had in mind for her uh, to seeing some wonderful ministries blossom out of that through Lutheran Latino Ministries. So we've got a, a great group of folks on the call today. There's about 13 or 14 of us and folks on the call will be having a chance to comment and ask questions a little bit later. But first, we're just going to start off with some time with Pam and I in conversation together. So you're connecting right now with the Now Start Network, which is just a connection of people, a groundswell, we call it, of leaders across the Northwest District of the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate who are interested in seeing new starts cropping up throughout our district to reach new people with the love of Christ Jesus. And so each time we have one of these calls, we have a guest on hmm. who tells us about something new that's happening. So we're excited about that today, and we're excited that you're connecting with us. Let me open this today with a couple words from David, from Psalm 25. David writes to the Lord, make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, and for you I wait all the day long. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All of the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. Who is the one who fears the Lord? The Lord will instruct him in the way. <clears throat> the friendship of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you make your ways known to us. And Lord, as we listen to Pam's story, we're going to hear how you made your ways known to her. And so encourage us through that, that you will do the same for each of us who fear you. We pray this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so, Pam, uh, just to start off with, tell us a little bit about your, your background, your, your life, uh, your, your career outside of Lutheran Latino. Oh, I'm pretty old, so it might take a while. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I was born and raised in Portland, except for my ninth grade year when we lived in Wichita, Kansas, because of my dad's job. And then we came back because that didn't work. Um, my mom had spent part of her youth in Tucson, Arizona. And when I was little, she taught me some Spanish words and I liked them and a Spanish song. And I just, and my dad was a ham radio operator and I used to hang out with him in his ham shack and listen to him talk to people from all over the world. And I just thought that was so interesting. And I was interested in learning other languages and God kind of gave me a gift for that and, and an interest in it. And um, when I was in the sixth grade, I thought it would be really cool to be an interpreter, but then I changed and in high school, I thought, okay, I'll be a teacher and I was gonna be a special ed teacher, but I tried out for the choir <clears throat> and 15 minutes later, I was a music major. <coughs> I've been involved in music all my life. My mom was a very accomplished pianist and my dad had in his young days, even been in vaudeville with a, comedy and music routine so and my big sister was in music theater and um so your dad performed on stage vaudeville acts but yeah he did yeah gags and crazy songs uh yeah when he was 12 he won a talent contest which was a year's uh contract on the orpheum vaudeville circuit in western oregon and northern california and so at age 12 and that would be 1930 he hitchhiked from gig to gig and made his own way. And uh, it was an experience. Anyway, <clears throat> um, I went to the college that I went to because of the voice teacher that was there. 
and my high school private teacher said, you need to study with this lady. And I really thought that I might maybe have a career in opera, but God shut those doors repeatedly. Um, the Portland conductor who was willing to give me parts the following season dropped dead one night after the last performance of the season. Then I was trying, and the new guy didn't have any use for me at all. And then, um, I, uh, God gifted me with a near fatal pneumonia that uh, kept me from advancing in a, a course and a, a study that could have been disastrous for me. So I thank God for that 17 days in the hospital. They didn't know I'd make it through the first week. And then when I tried again, <clears throat> a few years later, God sent me another baby. So I said, okay, I get the message. <laughs> And, yeah. um, but I did sing with the symphonic choir in Portland and I have soloed on the stage of the Keller Auditorium and um, wow. that was very fun, very fun and done recitals and guest soloist all around the Willamette Valley area. And, but that's not the main thing. The main thing that God's always led me to was serving people. I grew up at St. Peter's Episcopal Church on 82nd and Pine in Portland, very high church Episcopal, and Father Haley was a magnificent teacher for us young people. Um, there was a cohesive group of about 25 or 30 of us and uh, that he raised in that church and gave us a really good foundation of the faith. And one thing he taught us was that we are all missionaries. Everywhere we go, we are missionaries. We are ministers of the gospel. And um, that's just how I roll. When I was a teenager, I wanted, I thought that I might be a nun in the Episcopal orders. But I remember in my bedroom one day uh, thinking about that, the words came into my head so clearly that you will not be a nun, I have a family for you. I was like 16, so I thought I let go of that idea, but I wanted to be a missionary. And so when I um, could, when I was independent on my own, I volunteered at the Episcopal Layman's Mission Society in Portland, William Temple House. And then I got married to a Lutheran. And 10 years later, after trying to be involved in both churches, the Episcopal priest in Woodburn, where I was uh, there, I was the music director and the president of the Women's Guild and worked with the young people. And Father Spencer said, you need to get out of this spiritual taffy pool you're in and go be a Lutheran with your family. So here, that's how I arrived in the Lutheran church. And, um, mm -hmm. And most of your career then was teaching music? Yes, I started as a public school music teacher in small K through eight rural independent school districts in January of 1970. And then they had to consolidate into K-12 unified districts in 92. Um, and in between, I did a couple of years of uh, teaching voice and leading a women's chorale at the university level. Okay. I taught a little bit of voice at Portland State and a little bit at um, uh, about a year and a half at Western Oregon University wow. on the mater. And that was an experience going back and teaching at the same place where all the staff was still there who knew how all my stupid stuff I did as a student, you know, and yeah. put up with me uh -huh. and then treated me as an equal as a peer. It was quite an experience in grace and humility. And then um, in 2003, uh, through a reduction in funding, I kind of lost my half-time job at my local school here in Scotts Mills. And, uh, but in 1998, there was a game changer. <laughs> My dad in 97 was in his final illness and died in March of 98. And on my birthday, December in 97, 
I got hit in the back of the head with a high speed basketball accidentally off of the hand of a pretty strong seventh grader. I was injured, I was grieving, it disabled my singing voice for a couple of years and tried teaching K through eight music uh, without being able to yeah. sing yeah. or having to speak through a microphone. You know, it called for some creativity. But anyway, I went on a private prayer, a individual prayer retreat. And on the way home, because at that time I was teaching music in five different elementary schools, and I prayed that God would give me a, an easier job physically and I said, I feel that you are calling me into a bigger involvement with Latino ministries and my Spanish is pretty weak. So I, I don't have the energy to take class this year. So just whatever you have in mind. And two weeks later, the junior high in Silverton called and said that they had just lost their Spanish teacher. Could I come and teach first year Spanish to the eighth graders? Wow. Well, if you're going to, if you're going to, teach you got to study right that's a great so, way to learn it and and i um i was still at that point half time at my local school <clears throat> and part time at the junior high in silverton which is about eight miles away so tell us a little bit so that's a little bit of sort of the trajectory of your life leading mm -hmm. up to your connection with lutheran latino ministries tell us just briefly about the start of lutheran latino ministries i understand that that was started in the 1980s, but it didn't actually become an organization until around the year 2000? Um, yeah, in mid to late 80s, uh, Polo and Marta Garcia, who were uh, kind of Pentecostal style missionaries, they wanted to, they had become committed Christians. They wanted to be missionaries and they envisioned themselves in Africa or Central America, but God sent them to Woodburn and they were kind of disappointed, but they, <laughs> they said, okay. And they <clears throat> did <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> ministry in 103 migrant camps around the Woodburn area, meeting natural needs and then spiritual needs. They started a home church, but um, our church secretary at Trinity Lutheran Mount Angel was had grown up in Arizona and had a real heart for the Mexican people. And so she kept bugging me. She got in touch with them somehow. Like maybe they con contacted local churches for support or something. I'm sure they did because the ELCA church in Woodburn adopted them as a mission. But Norma, bless her heart, kept bugging me. You speak some Spanish. You should come to this. You speak some Spanish. You should come help with this. And I had young kids and I didn't want to spend the time, but she wore me down. So I went to a meeting and then we had our <clears throat> monthly meetings and planned how to advance the ministry and mission. Um, a little group of us, there was people from St. John Salem, uh, Ralph Peterson from Oregon City, Trinity, Oregon City. Uh, Erwin and Lillian Nicodemus and me and Norma from Trinity Mount Angel, a couple of people from Hope and Woodburn, I think. And uh, yeah, so we met once a month and we were trying to raise funds to put on the Spanish language Lutheran Hour. <clears throat> the Ray Hanneman from Trinity, Oregon City wanted that done. He was big in the Lutheran Layman's League. He wanted to see that happen. So we got together and we tried raising funds for that. And we did, but um, for the local radio station, but the Polo and Marta, they perceived that the um, tone of the Lutheran Hour broadcast at that time was like a little more urban than their very rural uh, clientele. So, they did it themselves and Pastor Polo would preach and then they'd have a call in afterwards. And through that process, they built a little congregation. And then it, we kept meeting. <clears throat> we didn't really know what to call ourselves. Some people called us the Hispanic Ministry of the Willamette Valley or something like that. I don't know. But we didn't really have a name and we kept going to the district for assistance, but nobody would help at that moment. 
and they kept saying, um, gather people from various congregations together and get a group to support this and we'll think about it. That's kind of the message I remember getting. And our reaction was, uh, didn't we? Because <laughs> we already had that. Going. Already had it, yeah. But then uh, we got a little more traction. And in 1998, my sweet Norma passed away. And so I kind of inherited the position of secretary treasurer of the group. And then um, <clears throat> Hello, Pam. I think we lost your audio. I think you're back okay, with okay. us. You're back. Yeah. We yeah. Can do that. yeah. <laughs> Tell you what, so, let's, let's. I think you're you're just around uh, 1998 or 2000. Right. Ralph Peterson uh, put on a convocation in Woodburn to see if there was any interest in supporting Hispanic ministries, and 98 people from the whole area from Vancouver down to almost Eugene and the coast all came together. Am I lost again? Oh, you're here with okay, us. Okay, good. Going. Ah. Okay. Um, so that was encouraging. And so we started to pray because the ministry was growing and it was too much for Paul and Marta. And uh, we prayed, we started praying for a husband and wife um, Latino team that could serve as missionaries for us and uh, for God <laughs> and through us. And so um, in 2002, Miguel and Marta Luna began attending um, Hope Woodburn through a series of different circumstances. And Pastor Zagel in 2003, March 20, 23rd, I think it was, 2003, uh, said, Miguel, why don't we have some Spanish services here? And the next Sunday, March 30th, 2003, was the very first Spanish service at an LCMS church in Oregon that I've ever heard of. Okay. So we're celebrating 20 years this month. 20 years. Of, of Spanish language worship. And um, <clears throat> so from, meanwhile, uh, Ralph also gave um, workshops on ESL tutoring. And so Ascension Portland and Trinity Portland both started ESL ministries. And that was a good start for our, uh, to open the door for people to come into the congregations. <clears throat> Pam, if you could tell us what, what is your role with Lutheran Latino Ministries now? Okay, I was elected president in 2004 when Pastor Zagel took a call to work with Ambassadors of Reconciliation. And since then, people just keep reelecting me and yeah. they think I'm doing an okay job. Yeah. And <laughs> I keep trying to get somebody else there and mentor people in and like that. But um, so far, it hasn't happened. And what I do is I handle the administration, the kind of the business end of things. Um, I was privileged to, well, I, re I took early retirement from teaching in 2005 so I could have time to spend on uh, ministry stuff. And so I got to work with families and individuals in ministry then. And um, doing the uh, administration of the business. Uh, we became a 501c3, we became an RSO. I jammed through all that paperwork. Wow. Pastor Zagel and I did the 501c3 together. And uh, let's see, then I also was privileged to um, try to arrange the call when Pastor Miguel uh, was colloquized. I took classes with him as language facilitator, but through doing that, I became a certified lay assistant, which I never thought I could do because I didn't know girls could do that. And um, then the seminary entrusted me with uh, facilitating the entry level classes for a group of Latino people in Portland. And out of that group came Pastor Roberto 
and uh, that was quite a privilege and an honor. Um, it all involves some sacrifice too, you know, because we so, spent, the people in the class and I spent about five years of Sunday afternoons. And Sundays were long for me because I would go to church at my own church and then I'd eat lunch on the road and go to Portland and teach the class. Then they asked me to stay and play for the 5 p.m. Spanish service which was beautiful. I loved it. And I got acquainted with the people there at Trinity and uh, it was great. So, so if I could just yeah. recap, you found yourself going from being a school teacher, teaching music, to teaching Spanish, to connecting with this growing Lutheran Latino ministries, to being the president of this ministry, to establishing it as a 501c3, to teaching theology classes to prospective students in Spanish on, on theology and to helping formulate and lead some of the first Spanish language worship services in the Portland area in Oregon. And that was all things that God led you into. Now you've told me a story about <laughs> how you remember something that happened as a child and this is how you picture what God did to you. For you. Yeah. <laughs> you tell, did it tell to us me, all that right. story. Yeah. Tell us that story. Okay. So um, our neighbor across the street in Portland had a big station wagon and five children. And um, in the summertime, when it was really hot, he liked to swim. And so he would pack uh, his kids and me and my sister and sometimes my brother in the big station wagon and take us up to Rooster Rock State Park on the Columbia River, which then was not a nude park. It was just barely had dressing rooms there. But we would go and splash around. I couldn't swim. My sister couldn't swim. He had taught his kids to swim, but we'd all just kind of splash around in the water. But Mr. Edgel, he was a really muscular man. Wasn't big, but muscular. And he would swim. And I don't know how far out he swam. But one Sunday, in, I'm not Sunday, but one evening in August, um, he came back from his swim and he came over to me and my sister and said, come with me. And he took me in his right hand and he took my sister in his left hand. And I was, by then I was about five foot five. I was a tall kid for my age. So we start walking out into the river and he's got us and it's up to my knees and then it's up to my waist and then it's up to my chest and then it was right up to my chin here and I'm bouncing along on my tippy toes trying to keep the water out of my mouth and I'm thinking this is kind of crazy but um Mr. Edgel had me so I knew I was okay and we walked and we walked and we walked and then he stopped and he said now look around and I looked around and we were standing dead center in the middle of the Columbia River. Wow. And <laughs> it was crazy and it was flowing low and slow and, and muddy. And um, if he had let go of either one of us, I don't know what would have happened because neither one of us could swim, but um, he must have walked that path before to know where to take us. And it dawned on me about 15 years ago or so that as God leads me into all these different tasks in ministry, that's where I am. He's got a hold of me and I'm in the middle of something that if he let go of me for a second, I would be lost, but he's got me. So as long as he's got me, I'm there. And, yeah. and when we started from Psalm 25, uh, before this call began, uh, we looked at it and you said, well, verses four and five are really meaningful to me. Make known to me your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths, guide me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. My hope is in you all day long. And that's what I hear when you tell that story, how God's led you down this path of leadership through Lutheran Latino ministries in ways that you never thought you could do and doing things you didn't expect. And now Lutheran Latino ministries is starting some more new ministries in the Yakima area, the Hermiston area of Washington, as well as in Salem, Oregon. 
just briefly, because we want to leave time for uh, some comments, can you share with us briefly what's happening in those places and what you're trying to help coordinate? Yes, with uh, when Pastor Miguel passed away in 2017, we were just kind of all at sea. We didn't know, okay, now what are we supposed to do? And God blessed us with bilingual pastors who could maintain the worship services and so forth. But uh, Deaconess Marta's whole life had been partnering with her husband. So it was, it was a really difficult transition time for us, but now we've got some traction under us. Um, we are working through Redeemer in Salem and she works with various community agencies there and is bringing, and, and the neighbors there. Uh, there's a lot of Latino people around Redeemer Lutheran in Salem and um, she's working at bringing them into the church. And so in uh, Hermiston, a couple from uh, Woodburn had moved up to uh, Umatilla and they were driving back to Woodburn for church about once a month. And they said, can we please have church closer? And so Pastor Lopez um, from Woodburn, he's been there since 2016, which is a wonderful thing. Um, he said, do we have a church out there? So I contacted Pastor Adams at Bethlehem in Hermiston and um, the church council and elders were all in favor. And uh, so Pastor Lopez went up there a few times and the weather turned against them. <laughs> Yeah, or traveling up the, the gorge. And uh, so that ministry kind of went dormant it, without getting any real traction. But in September, I went to um, uh, Hermiston and Yakima to give some workshops and encourage the people there to, and, and some visioning, maybe strategic planning workshops on what they might do to uh, involve themselves with the majority population in their area. Uh, Hermiston is over 50% and Yakima is over 70% Hispanic. And uh, we need an LCMS presence among the people because with an LCMS presence, they get truth and Christ. And so anyway, um, I need to check up on people in Hermiston because they had came up with a strategy of four things that they wanted to be doing, but I haven't checked up on them yeah. in a while. So I have to encourage them. In Yakima, uh, Pastor Eric Moeller, who was for a time the bilingual pastor at Trinity Portland and Pastor Roberto and Pastor Lopez were tag teaming uh, monthly services in Spanish at Yakima. Bethlehem and Yakima. But um, Pastor Eric took a call to teach at uh, Concordia River Forest. And with his leaving, Roberto, who was just um, ordained last March, coming up on his anniversary in a week and 10 days here, um, his duties are preventing him from making the trip. Plus, he works full time. And so Pastor Lopez is doing it pretty much on his own and we are praying for workers. We're trying to get some of the lay people who we have trained to go and at least conduct a prayer service uh, and a, an afternoon prayer service, like one o'clock or so, so that they can go up, do the work and come back and be ready for their own secular jobs on Mondays. So uh, that's what's happening. And Roberto has something very exciting happening uh, with his um, hometown people and uh, working with Lutheran Heritage Foundation and a professor in um, Yucatan to get the small catechism and some Christian tracts into the uh, Mayan language, the Yucateco Mayan language. And, uh, and there is a lot of Maya people in Portland area too. And so with Roberto being able to, uh, you know, having Maya as his native language, it's a wonderful mission field all around. Exciting. Uh, thank, thank you, Pam. And thank you, Roberto, for all that work you're doing. Uh, for those who are on this call who haven't 
heard the call last March, March of 2022. Now you can go back out to the nowstart.net website and find that conversation with Roberto uh, right after he was ordained or right before even it might have been. And Pam, uh, just to highlight, you talked about that Yakima ministry. One of the things you're looking for, in addition to uh, some lay people who speak Spanish who are willing to be trained to go in there and lead prayer service. Also, any pastors who are willing to come in uh, once a month or so and and share a message that can be translated into Spanish. Yes. Uh, by yes. a translator, that would be really helpful. And the way that we do that in Woodburn when Pastor Lopez is not there is the, the visiting, the guest pastor sends me his this manuscript of his sermon about a week ahead of time so that we can put it into Spanish and then we have uh, an elder who reads it for okay. the congregation. Yeah, so, so very doable. Let's take and also oh, the, the, the visiting pastor would also do the the uh, absolution and the consecration and the benediction. Yeah, that would be really helpful. Uh, let's take a few moments and just have people share comments and questions. Or if you've got a thought you want to share, put a question mark in the chat box. There's a chat function at the bottom of the page. Uh, click on that. Just put a question mark in there, and then I'll call on you, and you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. Meanwhile, while people are thinking about their questions or what they want to ask, um, Pam, if you could share one thing with uh, <clears throat> lay leaders listening to this call who may never have imagined themselves in a leadership role in a new ministry, what would you say to encourage them? Trust God to provide you with the interests and the skills that you need because we all believe Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, right? That we are God's masterpiece, his workmanship prepared in it for, to do the works that he has ready for us in advance to fulfill his purpose. So trust that he has prepared you or like he did with me, prepare you as you go along. <laughs> You have to just jump in and trust that he will prepare you. I don't think that Peter and John, fishermen, ever anticipated writing scriptures yeah. that would train and nourish Christians for the next 2,000 years. I don't think they ever anticipated that, but God equipped them as they went along. And he gives you some interest or some talent or something because he has prepared something for you to do. And so don't miss his promptings. Pray frequently, but don't just ask for stuff. Um, listen. listen. Give yourself silent listening time. And meditate on the scriptures. Let him speak to you. Just be still and know that he's God and listen to what he is guiding you to do. And don't be a Jonah, just do it. Just do it. Well, you certainly hear that in your story from uh, the time when you started <laughs> praying about Latino ministry to starting to teach Spanish classes uh, to the encouragement from, from somebody else to get involved in this Hispanic ministry. Uh, Toby <laughs> Tokol um, is a pastor in Yakima and he had a, Hey, a thought you wanted to share? Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and share with us, Toby. Well, I, 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 I met Pam, and she came out to Bethlehem. I was the interim there, and and uh, it, it would be so nice to have a Hispanic pastor as part of the team in, in Yakima. And I'm not giving up hope yet. I, I'm trying to. I know that uh, not all of us bringing a new pastor later in April. And then uh, Bethlehem and Peace are in the process of calling a pastor. And between the three churches, I, I see a potential of, of doing more, of bringing, because Pam, Pam is absolutely right. I, you know, my son and I, every once in a while, we'll go over to Buffalo Wild Wings over there at the mall in Union Gap, and, and uh, we're the only Caucasians there. 
I mean, everywhere you go, uh, my wife goes to Walmart and uh, she feels like she's in Mexico. Uh, there are so many, it, the, the ministry is so much potential. It's hard to get the lay people behind it, I think, because of, uh, they've had some experiences before that were not positive. Uh, but I think it was just due to a, a lack of leadership uh, that, uh, you know, Mo and Judy Garcia were members of Peace, but, you know, he's 80 some years old and he's just not able to do what he used to do. And my heart is still with interim ministry. I like to do that. Uh, and, uh, but I'm not giving up yet. I'm going to continue to be a cheerleader for Hispanic ministry in, in, in Yakima. And uh, the minute the new pastor gets to Mount Olive, I'll be talking to him and the church council, and I'll, I'll continue to encourage. I still preach at Bethlehem in peace, and I probably <laughs> tell them they're still in the call process. Maybe uh, they'll change their mind, you know, the possibility of, of even having uh, Marta come and, and do some outreach uh, would be an outstanding thing. So anyway, you got my full support, Pam. I'm, and I, I, I pray often for you and for the Hispanic ministry in the Northwest District. Thank you. Um, when Marta went up with Pastor Rue in November, she did talk to the Bethlehem people about helping them to do a vacation Bible school. Yeah. And uh, we do have another retired deaconess, Luz Guerrero, who just moved into the Vancouver area. And... Um, wonderful worker and so i'm going to see if i can pry her a little bit out of retirement i have also had several conversations with the seminary and with the four-year vicarage director in, at concordia irvine in the cross-cultural ministry and it's we're we're searching we're actively looking to recruit somebody you know, if you if you know of somebody that, especially the cross cultural ministry, I've known some guys over that have done that ministry, and and uh, I could certainly uh, push that direction to Bethlehem and Peace. That be, you know, they get someone out of seminary to come in and start a cross cultural ministry. Uh, I'm not the um, uh, circuit counselor, uh, Mark. Uh, Mark, what's this guy's recent is. He, he, he's the man to talk to about that, but I'm, I'm going to continue to push it and I'll do whatever I can to help be helpful. Thanks for being a part. Yeah, that's great. So I think part of this call too is just recognizing that each of us can do something, whether that's, um, whether that's praying for it or getting involved in small ways, encouraging other people to consider it or just connecting with Pam to find out what, what can I do? How can I be a part of this ongoing effort? So there's another everybody... thing. Oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead, Pam. There's another concern yeah. that's always heavy on me and I'm constantly, almost daily giving it over to God. And that is that um, when Deaconess Marta was commissioned as a deaconess, Lutheran Latino Ministries called her She's our called and commissioned worker. And um, we are her only source of livelihood. And if not for a very large gift from a congregation here in the Willamette Valley that closed a year or two ago, and another large um, endowment that was gifted to us by one of our champions, we might have had to let her go but i remember in 2010 december we thought that we would have to let both miguel and marta go for lack of funding and god has never let us down but that is a constant concern especially now that she is a widow with one teenager still at home that i trust god to provide for her but he does that by opening the hearts and wallets of people in the LCMS and it's not like we're like uh, right to life or cancer society or something like that this is a denomination specific ministry which severely limits our donor pool so um, that's another thing that we pray for 
since the, especially, I was just amazed at the resolution that passed the convention, it's commending generous support from members of the district and congregations in the district. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a concern too. And we have our deaconess intern, who we are also uh, providing a stipend. So that's from coming from 1998, when we could barely scrape together $85 a week to put the um, radio program on the air for 15 minutes a week, you know, uh, to having a budget of $90,000 a year. That's a long way. <laughs> that is a long way. Got yeah. done a lot with Luke and Latino Ministries. And we certainly want to encourage that everyone listening to this call, if you have the opportunity to support this financially or to encourage your congregation to do that, that would be wonderful. Yep. And visit Here. our website because on our website, yep. there's a, a history and there's frequently asked questions. There's, and, which I send out to all the congregations in the district in uh, September, October. And there will be a link to that website with more information at the now start where this recording will live as well. People will be able to watch this recording, connect to the, the LLM website. But uh, that website is just LutheranLatinoMinistries.org. Is that correct? That's correct. That's another thing that God equipped me to do. I, I write the newsletters and I keep the website up and going. I started the website and it was because of the training that I got when I was teaching Spanish and ESL. And it's just God equips you to do stuff, you know? So and for it. all those who are on the calls, you're thinking about, well, what can God do with me? The more you network with people like Pam or like Roberto or others who are on this call, um, you'll begin to see opportunities where God can use you too. If it's, if it's something you like to do in person rather than just on Zoom, we have an opportunity for that coming up this April, April 21st. And 22nd, we're going to be in Puyallup, Washington at Emanuel Lutheran Church with our in-person Now Start Network event. It's called Germinate. We're trying to keep it really inexpensive so folks can come. If you come with a group from your church, it's just $25 a person. If you come by yourself, it's $50. Um, but come to Puyallup on a Friday evening, we'll be gathering together in three on the Ave Coffee Shop, which is Emmanuel's Coffee Shop, to learn about that ministry and how it started and what kind of community partners they have. And then on Saturday, we'll have some speakers joining us. We'll have a speaker from Garden City Church, which is not a LCMS church, but it is a church plant in Puyallup. And they're, one of their church planting pastors is going to come talk to us about the logistics of church planting, the challenges and joys of it. And then after that, we have an LCMS speaker coming in who's coming from the Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd, which is in Seattle, who has just broken ground in December on a new homeless ministry, which is a housing project on their property and how they're going to be housing homeless and starting ministries to care for them. And so uh, Steve Tucker is going to be with us. He's going to be sharing with us about, and he's a lay person from that congregation, a lay leader who, a lot like Pam, uh, was walked by Jesus right into the midst of this homeless ministry. We're excited to hear from him. There's also going to be an opportunity there for teams to come and present your new start ideas and a thousand dollars of new start money that's being given by Lutheran Church Extension Fund. And it's there waiting for the team that has the best, um, the best new idea. We'll be awarding that thousand dollars of money to you to get it going uh, so that you don't have to try to scrape together $85 a month for a, a radio program but those are just some of the things coming up with now start uh, we look forward to seeing people there it's just a network there's no membership there's no fees uh, we only charge just to make things happen uh, but we have a lot of support from the district as well and so we're thankful to the northwest district for supporting this event that's coming up in puyallup and we look forward to another one of these now start all network calls coming up in mid-may we do these the third week of every other month so the third week of May, we'll be doing this again. We look forward to having you connect with us then. And again, if, if there's anybody you know who would be encouraged by this call, uh, send them to www.nowstart.net. Sometime next week, this recording will be out there. They can listen to it. They can be encouraged by it too. 
Uh, Pam, any last words you'd like to say before we close for today? If anybody thinks of any questions or anything, um, Lutheran Latino Ministries at gmail.com. Great. I'll Lutheran be Latino Ministries at gmail.com. Pam answers that email. And to learn more about that ministry directly, Lutheran Latino Ministries.org, and you'll find it there. We hope everybody has a great Saturday. We, we want to let you get back to it. Thank you for everyone who joined with us on the call today. If you joined us, uh, your email and information is now in our Now Start network database, and we'll be sending emails to let you know when the next Now Start event is coming up because you're now a part of Now Start. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Have a great week in the Lord. God's blessing. Thank you. Thank you.